The following recorded program is part of the Mount Sinai Medical Center Lecture Series, offered by Mount Sinai Medical Center in cooperation with the City of Sunny Isles Beach. I'm Anna Asuncion. I'm one of the internists here at Mount Sinai, the Sunny Isles Satellite. Um, we are a teaching institution, so I do have resident physicians. Three of them are here with me today, and they will present various topics. Okay, Today's topic is about surveillance of different um, cancers and other diseases. Um, these are topics that you probably talk about with your primary care physician on, during your annual visit. Um, so these are our, our objectives. I have Barbara Pachurko talking about women's health. I have uh, Dr. Janine uh, Suarez talking about cancer screening. And I have Dr. Oksana Harlamova talking about vaccinations. Um, We'll be talking about the guidelines. Uh, as you know, guidelines change every five to 10 years. Like I'll have many patients asking me about how often they need to take their various vaccines. Believe it or not, the guidelines change quite often, anywhere from five to 10 years. We base our guidelines on several organizations, and these are the organizations that most internists use. The United States Preventative Services Task Force, the Amer American College of Physicians, and the Centers for Disease Control. Now, mind you, there are many other medical organizations that come up with these guidelines. So you might find your OBGYN might use their, their own guidelines. The gastroenterologists use their own guidelines. They are guidelines. They're not, um, they're meant to assist the doctors and the patients to make the right decisions, okay? Um, and we might vary outside the guideline. We might veer away from the guideline depending on each person's need, okay? Um, with that, we're gonna start off with the first topic of women's health, and I would like to present Dr. Barbara Pachurko. She'll so we'll talk about various things. Please save your questions for the end. We will be here to ask, to answer anything that, um, any questions or concerns you have. Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm glad that you come here to listen to us. Um, as uh, Dr. Asuncion said, my name is Barbara Pestruk. I'm one of the residents from Mount Sinai, and I work here in San Ials with Dr. Asuncion, and sometimes I work also in Aventura's uh, office with Dr. Harris and Skylake. Um, so I'm going to talk about women's health. Our first topic will be breast cancer. And why is this important? It's very important because it's one of, of the most common cancer in women and is the second most common cause, cause of cancer death in women as well. Um, but the good news is that with all the screening that we're doing, actually the mortality since the 1970s has decreased. Um, and this is, as I say, because of all the screening and the therapy that we have now available to treat this disease. Um, so if we found cancer earlier, then we can treat that earlier and we save lives as well. Um, so how do we screen for breast cancer? I know that most of you are familiar with our screening test, which is kind of an x-ray, and it's called mammogram. Um, sometimes if we find something that is abnormal in those screening tests, um, then we'll do what is called a biopsy. The doctors take a little bit of tissue and we look it under a microscope to see if there's any abnormal cells or any cancer. And then we can discuss treatment and what else, what would be our next um, step. So how often do we need to screen women and for how long? That's a good question. Usually we recommend to start around the 40s to 49. Uh, we'll get a, a, at least our first mammogram and it will depend on the patient's history as well and risk factors. From uh, 50 to 74 years old, we do it every year or every two years, depending on what the patient's uh, wishes are and if they have any concerns or any family history. And then after 
75 years old, we can stop doing the screening mammogram if it's the patient's wishes. And then, um, as I said before, also depends on other risk factors. So this is something that you always need to talk with your physician. But this is what the guidelines recommend for screening. Um, our next topic will be cervical cancer, um, which is also uh, one of the third most common gynecological cancer in women. Um, what is the cervix? So if you look at the picture, the cervix is the bottom portion of the uterus. And usually what is cancer is when the cells get um, they're abnormal and they start growing and they're out of control. So that's what we call cancer. Um, it's important because this type of cancer, sometimes they don't give us any signs or any symptoms. But with the screening test that we do, we can cut them early and start treatment early. And as I already say, this way we save lives. Um, what is the most um, common risk factor for this cancer is a virus, a viral infection, which is called the human papilloma virus. Um, this is a virus that many people carry and we're not aware of because it doesn't give us any symptoms. It usually gets transmitted throughout uh, sexual relationships and sometimes our body, uh, our immune system fight it um, and we don't have any symptoms and we don't develop any cancer. But sometimes, like 10 to 20% of these patients, the, viral, the virus will stay in our body, and that can lead to abnormal cells, and that can lead to cancer in the future. But it takes years to happen. So um, what symptoms can we see um, if, if there are any symptoms? Because sometimes it's completely asymptomatic, as I say. Um, bleeding between periods um, is something that can uh, be concerning and can be one of the symptoms of the cancer. Uh, bleeding after menopause, um, that's another uh, sign that is very important to discuss with your doctor. And also sometimes bleeding after sex can be one of the signs of this type of cancer. Um, so there's also a vaccine um, that is kind of new for the younger population to prevent the infection of this virus that is HPV. And usually we're recommended in women from 9 to 26 years old and boys from 9 to 21 years old, but it can be given up to uh, 26 years old. Um, and also the other thing that is very important is the smoking sensation, because smoking has also been uh, related with increased risk of cervical cancer. Um, what is the test that we usually do is called a Papa Nicolau test, which is also the pap test or the pap smear. And what the doctor usually do sometimes is the primary physician or sometimes is the gynecologist. They do a pelvic exam and they take with a brush or a spatula some of the uh, cells from the cervix and they look them in the, under a microscope and then can see if there's any abnormalities in those cells. How often should we screen and when do we start doing this test? Usually around 21 years old is when we start doing it. Um, we can do it every three years if the exams are negative. Um, and then if we test for the virus uh, and also we do the pap smear, we can do it every five years if everything comes back negative. And when do we usually stop uh, doing this test? Around 65 years old. Um, we recommend that there's no need if we have at least three negative um, uh, pap tests or two negative pap tests with also a negative um, viral test. And then we stop. There are people who had a hysterectomy where the cervix was also removed. Those people, they shouldn't be screened because they don't have the cervix, so there's no way they can have cancer from it. So we don't need to screen those people. Um, but bear in mind that some people, they have their uterus removed, but they still have the cervix. So if, you're not, if you don't know, um, you can always ask your gynecologist or your primary care doctor if you need to be screened or not. But at age uh, 65, usually is when we stop if everything was negative. And my last topic will be osteoporosis. And what is osteoporosis? So it's what we call a disease that makes your bones weak. Um, and what's the problem we have in weak bones is that we have an increased risk, 
risk for fractures if we fall. Even if we've had a regular fall from our height, let's say we fall to the, to the ground, we still can have a fracture because our bones are very weak. And this disease doesn't give us any symptoms at all. Um, but when we do fall, we may have that fracture. And that sometimes changes our lives uh, dramatically because those patients, they need to go to the hospital. They sometimes require surgery. And sometimes those people, they can't ambulate after that big surgery or the, um, or the fall or the fracture. And some of the people may need, um, after being discharged, going to a nursing home instead of going home because they can't walk by themselves or they can't take care of themselves. So it's very important not only as for the disease, but also because of what can happen if we broke a bone. And as I say, it doesn't give us symptoms, so we don't know. So how do we diagnose osteoporosis? Usually what we do is a special x-ray that is called a DEXA scan. And it doesn't hurt. It's just like a regular x-ray. We don't feel anything. And we start screening people from 65 years old or older. And we may do this test before that age if they have other risk factors for osteoporosis, some of medications, um, some other disease increase the risk of osteoporosis. And that's when your physician will tell you, OK, I will order this test because I want to see how your bones are doing. Um, and who is at risk? As I said, women older than 65, male or older than 70 uh, years old, people who have low vitamin D level and calcium levels, or sometimes disease that may decrease your vitamin D level or calcium. Um, people who drink alcohol can also have an increased risk. Um, then uh, who else? People who they don't exercise much and they stay in bed. Those people, they're all, they have also increased risk factors for osteoporosis and um, usually smokers and thin people. And also, if you have family members with osteoporosis and fractures, that can also um, be also a risk factor for this. And then what is important always is not only to treat osteoporosis, but also to prevent falls. So what do we usually do? We tell our patients to always wear comfortable shoes um, with a rubber sole. Um, make sure the house is safe, that there's no rags that are moving around, there's no electrical cords that you can trip over with, um, there's good lightning in the house. We always send our patients to have an eye check to see the ophthalmology and make sure that their vision is right. Um, and sometimes patients who have a lot of um, medications, what we call is polypharmacy, when they're in a lot of medications, um, some of the medications can reduce your blood pressure too quickly and that can make you feel dizzy and then you fall. Um, some other medications may make you feel tired, weak. Um, so we try to look on those medications to see if we can change any of this and make the risk of falling a little bit um, less. And um, that was my talk, so we'll continue now. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Janine Suarez. I'm also one of the residents at Mount Sinai. And I work with Dr. Asuncion at the Sunny Isles Clinic. And today I'm gonna to be talking about colon cancer um, and prostate cancer, as well as lung cancer, how and when to screen for it, and some statistics about each of them. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is colon cancer. And the risk of developing colon cancer is actually slightly lower in women than in men. Um, in the US, colon cancer is the third leading cause of cancer deaths. However, this rate uh, has been dropping in recent decades due to much improved screening and treatment for the cancer. Some risk factors for colon cancer would be smoking, um, being overweight, a diet high in red meats or any processed meats, drinking alcohol, advanced age, any history of polyps, history of inflammatory bowel disease such as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease, um, having type 2 diabetes, or um, the African-American race or Ashkenazi Jews. 
So for screening, we it is recommended to start at age 50 and to stop at age 75. Um, however, if you have a first degree relative that had colon cancer before the age of 50, you want to start screening um, 10 years earlier than the time of diagnosis of your relative. So there are several methods to screen. We're all very familiar with the colonoscopy, which is every 10 years. Um, however, if you get your colonoscopy done and the gastroenterologist thinks that you should they found a polyp or some abnormal cells, they might ask you to come in a bit earlier, um, one year or five years. And then the other methods are through stool samples. So FOBT measures the blood in your stool, um, and that would be done every year. And then the FIT DNA, which we're familiar with as Cologuard, it measures the blood and the DNA in your stool as a way to assess your risk for colon cancer, and that's done every one to three years. And then there's another method, it's called a flexid moidoscopy, which is um, the same preparation as if you're going to have a colonoscopy. Um, and it also measures, it's with the fit, so it measures the blood in your stool. So it's more or less the same thing as a colonoscopy, and that's every 10 years. The second cancer to discuss is lung cancer. So it is the second most common cancer in both men and women, but it is the leading cause of cancer death. And most people diagnosed are 65 or older. And the number one risk factor for lung cancer, as we all know, is smoking. So for screening, um, we start screening at the age of 55 and stop at 80. And people who are screened are people that have a 30-pack year smoking history and currently smoke or they've quit smoking within the past 15 years. So if you don't have a smoking history or you're not currently smoking, then you would not be screened. And the screening is done through an annual low-dose CT. So this is an example of what a CT would look like. These are the lungs and the heart. So the third cancer to discuss is prostate cancer. And one in nine men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer. The average age of diagnosis is 66. 66. Um, it is the second leading cause of cancer death amongst men. However, although it is a serious disease, most men uh, will not die from it. Um, it's very curable if it's found early. So the screening method uh, would be through a blood test and it measures PSA, which is uh, an antigen that is found in prostate cancer. And the screening is done on an individual basis. It's not required for every single man and it's started at 55 and stopped at 69. And it's something that you decide with your individual primary care physician if he or she believes that it should be, that you should be screened. So, and it's not recommended for men older than 70. So now, um, Oksana will be discussing vaccinations. Okay, hello ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dr. Oksana Harlamova, and um, I'm a resident as well, and I would like to discuss a very vivid topic, which is a vaccination. It's a lot of news around that topic, so we will, I'll try to you know, touch based on everything. So that's basically a table from a CDC, the Center of the Disease Control, that represents what any, popular, any person of a specific amount, uh, period of time should get vaccines. So we are looking at the yellow part. Yellow, that's basically what the vaccines we should get. Very first two lines, that's uh, influenza. Two types of vaccines, one before 50, another one after 50, every single year. Then the third line, it's going to be tetanus um, vaccine that some people will get, some don't. And then two more, uh, shingles and pneumonia. So those are the ones that will be focused in this particular talk. Okay, so we will start with influenza. Basically, we know, everybody knows what influenza is. And being sick as an adult of 20 year old, 40 year old, or 70 year old, it's a different story. That as older we get, we have a tendency to be way more sicker with the same virus as we would get the same virus 20 years younger. So we recommend for every single adult to have 
vaccine every single year. And uh, why do we get it every single year instead of just every 10 years? Because virus has a the tendency to change. And um, what they do, the researchers get together. They basically predict what kind of strains of the I virus will be active this year. And they will create the vaccine for that particular strain. That's the reason why we have to get it every single year, because the virus is changing. And given the vaccine a year ago, for that particular uh, strain will not work one year later. So that's a vaccine, very simple shot, once a year. And it will reduce your risk from 40 to 60%. So basically, not 100%. That's not the case. However, and in. Even what you get the, the flu shot, you still can get the flu, actual flu. And the tricky part is, yes, you'll be sick, but not as sick as if you would be without the vaccine. So vaccine has a tendency to basically uh, decrease the severity of, of the flu if you will be so unlucky to get it. So that's the flu. The next vaccine will be pneumococcal vaccine, or like pneumonia vaccine, or inflammation of the lung uh, type of vaccine. So that's a vaccine that we recommend for someone who is older than 65. And uh, if you are older than 65, you will qualify to get it. There are no contraindications to that vaccine. There are two shots, usually one shot when you're 65, and another shot 12 months later. And there are two shots for several reasons, the same. Bacteria has a tendency to, to change a little bit, and there are specific type of um, coating and things that we try to um, introduce the immune system to uh, with the first vaccine, and then a little bit different um, appearance of the same bacteria one year later. So your immune system will be basically exposed to, um, to that bacteria to the fullest, and you will be pre basically um, saved hopefully saved from that flu, I mean, from the pneumonia. Um, so the tricky part is if you, you can get that vaccine actually earlier if you qualify. And there are several conditions that make you qualify for it earlier, such as if you would have chronic medical conditions like diabetes, chronic smoking, heart diseases, liver diseases, kidney diseases, that your doctor might introduce that, um, that vaccine a little bit earlier than 65 or if you have immunocompromising conditions like uh, any type of cancer, leukemia, lymphoma, you are on ca uh, active chemotherapy, you have some kind of like HIV, any viruses that basically reduce your immunity, so that will make you qualify to get that vaccine earlier than 65. If you don't have any of those, at 65 you'll get your first shot and 12 months later the second shot. Um, the next vaccine that we are going to discuss is actually the vaccine that covers several diseases, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis. We basically um, focus on the third one, the pertussis. It's called whooping cough. It's called 100-day cough for a reason. Um, so right now, there is a tendency for that disease to be more prevalent. And that's the reason why we still recommend for everybody to get the vaccine. And the good news is only one shot every 10 years. So that's one shot, and then you're done for the next 10 years. It prevents illness in seven patients out of the 10 being exposed. So that's a pretty good um, kind of a safety profile. Um, something that we want to mention is that you might get that vaccine earlier than 10 years if you have some kind of stepped on a rusty nail and you'll, have, you'll qualify for like tetanus shot. Or if you have a grandchildren, grand-grandchildren who are younger than one year old, because those are very, very sensitive to, um, to uh, diseases, and especially pertussis, it might be very, very tragic for infants. So usually pediatricians will recommend to get vaccinated for everybody in the household. Parents, grandparents, whoever is really in close contact with that child. So it's mostly not for you, but for your grandchild, grandchildren, basically. So that's the, the, the shot. And uh, once again, it's every 10 years. And um, the last one that basically bring, brings a lot of news and a lot of attention is a shingle shot. So what is shingle? Basically, you have a virus, chicken pox, used to be in the childhood, um, that you, you, you get sick, and then that virus stays in your body 
for the rest of your life. There is no way you can get rid of it. It just stays with you. And as your immune system goes down, you have a chance to reactivate that virus. And as you age, that virus became, it's called shingles. Have you ever had shingles? Have you seen anybody or have you known anybody who have had shingles? Were they happy? Probably not. It's very, very, it's actually rush on the part of your body. Not really severe, but it's so painful. You cannot even blow it. You cannot even look at it. It's painful from just looking at it. And it's very, very, um, you're very miserable. And after that, sometimes it's called post herpetic uh, neuralgia. That's basically the same type of pain that you have, but already without the rush. That's just the, how virus can affect your nervous system and trick it and cause you that, that pain. So in order for not to have it, we have a shingles vaccine. So it used to be two vaccines. Right now we have two vaccines. The first one is Zostavox, which was the old version. And the, the new one is called Shingrix. That's a new one that a two doses vaccine. So everybody who is older than 50 will qualify to get it. One shot, you get it, and then two to six months later, you get the second shot. Uh, and that shot will basically prevent you from 91 to 97% from getting the shingles. As of now, the, the CDC recommends only those two shots and not, not repeating those shots. But things might change because with the new guidelines, sometimes they change things. So uh, don't be surprised that in a couple of years, right now doctors will start recommending to give like a small booster um, for that particular vaccine. But overall, the Shingrix, the two doses, that's the, basically the one that we recommend. And I believe the old one, the, the one shot, you probably will not even find it in any pharmacy. I really, really doubt. Um, okay, and now, um, question about the money. Is that covered? Uh, yes and no. Uh, usually, Part B covers your flu vaccine, your pneumococcal vaccine. If you stepped on a rusty nail, it will cover your tetanus shot, or if you're at risk, like hepatitis B shot. You probably didn't hear anything about shingles. And you probably will not, because Part D might, might, might or might not cover shingles as well. So shingles is something that is questionable right now. Even though that CDC recommends that, we recommend that, but Medicare might not cover it or might not cover it completely. So that's something that you will need to basically either contact your Medicare or talk to your provider, uh, how we can help you to, to manage that. But shingles still recommended, and hopefully the, the, the part that the, it's not covered by the insurance should not stop you from getting the vaccine. Okay, so that was our small talk. So if you have any questions, please let us know. We are all three here for you. So thank you, my wonderful resident physicians. They did a wonderful um, uh, topic. They covered pretty much everything that you would want to discuss with your primary care physician um, at, you know, during your visit. Um, I open this to any questions um, for the audience. Yes. Hold on, I'm coming with my... Oh, okay. First of all, thank you for coming. Well, I was just concerned about lung, lung cancer, even if you haven't smoked. Um, I know some of my relatives have gotten lung cancer at an early age without smoking. Is it secondhand smoke, or how do you, how do you get... I don't think we really know. There's been a high incidence of, of finding this in non-smokers. Um, there is some thought that maybe secondhand smoke is involved, but I don't think we're 100% sure. Who did the, um, did you find anything in your research? Yeah. So we're still speculating. There isn't really anything solid. Um, you know, they're looking at it. You know, I'm sure that plays a role. You know, I don't think we have any definitive answers yet. 
you know. No, I have seen cases of lung cancer occur in patients who've never had any smoking history and people who've not even been exposed to smoking. So um, I don't think we have an answer yet. But definitely if you are a smoker, you should ask your physician about screening if you fit the criteria, okay? And it is covered by Medicare, but you have to fit the criteria. And then mind you, guidelines change. And then, you know, our insurance companies will pay whatever they want to pay. And whether, whether the guidelines are there or not, it's really their decision. So I've had people um, come in and they get their um, annual uh, lung cancer screening with the CAT scan, and some get paid and some don't. Um, I think insurance is kind of very complicated. They complicate the picture so much. But it is available, and if you know that your insurance is covering it and you are a smoker, please ask your physician. Anybody else? I was sit down in here and listen all the conversation. Do you know my daughter-in-law, a young lady that she never was sick, she died at 52 years of lung cancer. And no I risk never, factors, I never, yeah. I never, I listened all that and I said, it's no, it's no answer for that. 52 years old, yeah. never smoke. Unfortunately, as I tell many of my patients, cancer is one of the, it's the wild card. Um, you could have done everything right in your life, don't smoke, exercise, eat right, and you can still get the can any kind of cancer. I mean, cancer is the wild card. I mean, when you compare diseases like cancer versus heart disease and diabetes, not that I would choose any disease, but heart disease you can control by diet, lifestyle, some various medications, and hopefully prevent that heart attack or stroke. But cancer is the wild card. Um, many of the tests that we do, like the mammogram, the colonoscopy, the pap smear, we've dis we know now, and we it's evidence-based medicine that if we that these are good, solid screening tests um, to prevent. Be, and Well, not to prevent, but to identify cancer early, because we now know that these cancers are very treatable. I mean, many women, think of how many women have breast cancer, and they've survived it, and they live normal lives af after that, and normal length of time, too. Um, it doesn't affect their, more, their uh, longevity. Um, but there are people who have bad breast cancer. They, you know, they're diagnosed and within six months they go. And that is what I call the wild card. There's no way to predict. There's no way to prevent. We can prevent heart disease, but I don't think we can prevent cancer. We can try our best and, you know, do these tests and, and detect cancer early so that we can do our best in treating it. But but I've had many patients who do the right thing, they don't smoke, they exercise, maybe they're vegetarian, and they still get cancer. And I've had patients who are 97 years old and they've smoked every day of their adult life and they never got lung cancer. At the end of the day, a lot of it is in our DNA. I think we're learning more about DNA. Um, I mean, a lot of the new therapies for cancer are based on DNA now. Um, and the more we know, maybe we'll be able to detect earlier and maybe identify those patients who are going to get cancer. I don't know if we really want to know that. <laughs> it might change the way we look at life. Um, you know, we have so many genetic tests now. I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I want to know if I'm going to get cancer or not, and then I'm just going to worry about it, spend the rest of my living days worrying about it, you know. Um, but um, no, I'm sorry that it, it, it does happen, and and I'm sure she probably did the right, all the right things in life, and still got it. And like I said, I have patients who've done, who've smoked every day in their life, and they don't get anything. They don't get any cancer. 
you know. Any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming then, and see you guys all next year. Thank you. That's a month from now. <laughs> <laughs>